Dr. Dennis Segru is a clinical professor, associate clinical professor at the University of Michigan. Um, he has also been the president of the National Sex Therapist Educators Association. He uh, worked for many years um, at Henry Ford uh, Hospital, and that's where he met Ralph, and Ralph indicated uh, the executive director of this program that he would be a terrific guest, and based upon the information that I've researched for, uh, of Dr. Segru, he's going to bring a lot of interesting ideas for both women and men. So. Help me welcome Dr. Dennis Segru. Thanks. How are you? Good. Thank you. Seat. So, Dr. Segru, you are a sex therapist. I am. So, when you go to the grocery store, when people ask you, what do you do? And you say, I'm a sex therapist. Or what do, you, what do you say? Well, you know, being a father of two sons, uh, they got maximum mileage out of that as they were growing up. <laughs> they, uh, uh, I wrote a book, uh, co-authored a book, Sex Matters for Women, and uh, my sons in college, whenever they would meet a new woman, uh, they would pull out the book, show it to them, <laughs> and say, I want you to know the apple didn't fall far from the tree. So they got <laughs> maximum mileage out of that. So. Well, hopefully they'll take care of you as, uh, as you age uh, well and, and they remember you. I certainly hope so. They, uh, as I said, they've got maximum mileage. Kids will ask them, what does your dad do for a living? They'll say, a sex therapist. They'll say, what does your mom do? And they say, <laughs> she smiles a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> well, for, for men and women, um, I, I saw you wrote somewhere about different gold standards. Yes. And in sexuality, what's the gold standard for a woman? For most women, probably the gold standard when we talk about sexuality and so forth is intimacy. It's connection. Um, a lot of times we will talk about orgasm and the importance of orgasm. Most of the surveys suggest that orgasm for women ranks about maybe number four. Um, things like communication, uh, intimacy, uh, and touch are important aspects for sexuality, whereas orgasm is down the list. As opposed to, I assume, the follow-up question, oh, the gold it, standard for, for men. men. Sure. If an orgasm doesn't play, take place for a guy, he didn't have sex. That's kind of the, the, the thinking. It, it is the gold standard for many men. And the interesting thing is we see with couples that um, as men get older, it becomes increasingly difficult or it takes longer before a guy can experience an orgasm or ejaculate. Matter of fact, we often say that age is probably the best cure for premature ejaculation, that as men grow <laughs> older, it takes longer and longer. So I'll have couples that will come in and the guy will complain, older couples, uh, will complain I just have a harder time ejaculating now, so why bother having sex? Now, meanwhile, his partner is sitting next to them. They've been married 35, 40 years, and we know that most women do not orgasm every single time they have sex. Uh, and that's considered quite normal. The, the plumbing is very different and so forth. And so I can't tell you how many times I've had the woman sitting, sitting next to her partner as he's complaining, why bother having sex? I can't ejaculate all the time. And the woman will say, honey, for the last 35 or 40 years, that didn't stop you from hitting on me, <laughs> even though you know I don't orgasm every single time. So there is that difference mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we see between men and women. You know, it, it, people end up in your office and they talk about these issues, but so many people don't end up in your office and they never talk about these issues because they're difficult to talk about. How, how does a couple that's never really talked about their intimate needs and sexual relations, do you have any advice for how they broach that topic with each other? Yes, I, th I think there's a number of things that can be done. I think the first thing, though, is um, it is so important. And it, it, it's ironic that we'll see couples that have been together for decades and they have faced life uh, in its fullness with tragic moments of bearing parents and dealing with job loss and illness and so forth. They, they have faced the joys of childbirth and raising children and so forth. And you would think if there's ever two people that have had this shared history that could talk about anything, right. this would be it. And yet 
clearly, so many couples do have that difficulty. So one of the things that I, I think for starters is just the importance of couples acknowledging, recognizing, people watching this program, for example, being encouraged that this is an area that is so important to talk about, to be able to share um, what we enjoy, the excitement of being physical with each other, our insecurities, and so forth. Sometimes what, uh, what we do as therapists when we're working with couples is we may say, you know, why don't you start with taking a series of maybe five or six simple questions that both of you will separately take some time and write down your answers. And then maybe one evening over a glass of wine or in front of a fireplace or going for a walk and so forth, exchange the answers. And the questions could be very simple, like the most exciting moment that we've ever shared was, or the part of your body that really excites me is, um, things like that. Now, mm -hmm. stay away from questions like the thing that really turns me off about you <laughs> is, okay. because that will so fizzle. Positive-oriented questions. All positive-oriented all questions. Positive -oriented questions. But to Not help. like, when are you going to stop? <laughs> yes. Or when are you going to start? start. Or, <laughs> yes. yeah. so, but with those types of um, questions, it helps a couple to start easing into talking about moving things further along in terms of maybe a later discussion, talking about the thing that uh, I feel most insecure about pleasing you as a partner is. And again, easing into those types of discussions, but they can be incredibly helpful and enriching for a couple. Now, as far as women, women go through menopause, is menopause an obstacle, a roadblock, a detour for sexual relations beyond that? You know, interesting, one of the myths in our society is that once a woman uh, hits menopause, becomes menopausal, that their glory days are over, that sex is essentially on the decline for them. The research suggests that that just isn't true. Uh, there's a number of studies out suggesting that one study asked that very question of a group of women, 50 and older, uh, is menopause the end of one's sexuality? 60% of, over 60% of the women said absolutely not. Another 20% said, ah, oh, the jury's still out. And a very small minority said, yes, I, I feel like I'm, I'm very different now and I just don't feel sexual any longer. A very uh, frequently cited study suggests that probably one third of women, uh, perhaps one in three, postmenopausal, will say that their sexual interest has declined since menopause. One third will say no change whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, a full third said, you know what, I wish I had this sexual energy 20 years ago. So uh, menopause certainly is not the beginning of the end. Since we're on one-thirds, and one-third of a woman's life is usually beyond the menopausal period, so why waste it? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you, we talked about the difficulty that a couple has uh, at times in talking about intimacy and sexual relations. Um, so it's advised in a, in a woman through menopause and maybe through some physical issues goes to her doctor. Why aren't doctors talking or asking about sex as much, and what can we do as patients about that? Sure. Well, I, I think that, first of all, there, there's probably a couple things that impact on doctors. One is that they are products of the same culture that all the rest of us are. We've grown up in a culture that has kind of this schizophrenic attitude about sexuality. On the one hand, we see constant commercials bombarding us with sensuality and half-clad bodies and so forth. And yet on the other hand, we have a very strong puritanical heritage that gives double messages to women, that gives uh, very uh, sex negative uh, messages to our kids as we're growing up. So that talking about sexuality is a very atypical behavior for most people growing up in their households. Now some families are exceptions to that, but for many kids growing up, sex is not talked about uh, openly. So we have physicians coming from that same background. I think the other thing is that many times physicians can uh, get caught up in terms of what they see as the medical necessities and sometimes don't appreciate the fact that in treating the whole patient, whether we're talking about doing a routine annual physical where questions about sexual functioning 
and we try to make this argument every time, certainly when I lecture to physician groups and so forth, is that that should be an essential question as part of a normal physical examination because it tells us a lot about overall health and well-being. But also physicians that are treating cardiac patients, physicians treating individuals that uh, in oncology units and so forth, where people have questions about they want to continue their lives. Even individuals who are terminally ill, it is a myth to say that those individuals are not interested in being physically intimate, that they're not interested in experiencing touch with a significant other. And yet, trying to get our, our oncologists and our cardiologists and so forth to appreciate that, that becomes our challenge. All right, so I, I have a health issue like this. I deal with my oncologist or I deal with whatever doctor it is, and they're not asking me that question. Do I ask them? And how do I, how do I frame the question to them? Is yeah. it as simple as, can I have relations tonight? Absolutely, and I, I, I appreciate the fact that that's asking for a lot of courage on the part of many individuals because I think whenever we find ourselves in a doctor-patient relationship, for many of us, the doctor's up here and sure. we're here, so it, it becomes kind of difficult. Now, some people have no problem coming right in like a Sherman tank and they will pound out their questions, and God bless them, that's wonderful. But it is difficult, I'm not going to, uh, uh, downplay that at all, but absolutely, I think it's important for people to say, um, being physically intimate with my partner is important. Um, when can we start back up? Or what activities are safe for us? And um, hopefully, people can be assertive and you know, essentially not be discouraged if the physician, I had one case where a physician uh, who had been treating, did surgery as an oncologist, uh, working on the, uh, the cancer with the individual, was so perturbed about being asked, uh, specific, being pushed on a sexual question, that he said, look, I just saved your life. What more do you want from me? Uh -huh. um, I think sometimes uh, that's when you may want to think about um, keep looking for a physician that you can relate with if it comes down to that. As doctors, by their training, are able to answer questions regarding sexual intimacy in relation to a physical ailment, correct? <laughs> Or not. Uh, that should be correct. Um, well, but I mean, you know, from a from a uh, maybe a embarrassment themselves, they might have uh, a difficulty themselves in talking about it. But by their medical training, they should be able to tell me if I take this medication or have this operation, I should withhold from sexual activity this period of time. When it comes to basic things such as dangers, risks, and so forth, uh, physicians are well trained in that. In terms of a general fund of knowledge about sexuality, sexual behavior, and so forth, one of the biggest problems that we're finding with many medical schools, and, and, and it's a legitimate problem, I'm not knocking medical education. I'm, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor at uh, the medical school at U of M. One of the challenges is that every year there is more and more research and medical knowledge that meanwhile the same length of time we have to train uh, medical students in terms of going out uh, to do their practice. So that uh, even though we would like to see more sexual education as part of medical education, if it's, are we gonna teach people about MRIs and are we gonna teach people about pharmacology and so forth, are we gonna talk about sex? The courses in medical school about sexuality, dealing specifically with sexuality, have been cut back and cut back. So unfortunately, Oftentimes, there isn't the knowledge that uh, we'd like to see physicians have when it comes to sexual behavior and being able to counsel their, their patients. Well, one last doctor question. I don't mean to beat up on doctors, but so ask your doctor. It's a legitimate question. They should be able to answer, and if they aren't comfortable, maybe switch doctors too. Either that or certainly not to feel apologetic that you're making your doctor blush with a question. Um, you know, they can always go see a therapist if they're embarrassed by that. Okay, all right, good, good. All right, let's switch to vaginas and vaginal health. Is use it or lose it, is that true? Believe it or not, actually there is some truth to that. Um, what we know is that um, the vagina, uh, interesting place, segue to move from doctors to the vagina, <laughs> right. that 
what we're talking about is that over time, especially with menopause and so forth, there's going to be changes in terms of vaginal health. Uh, we'll see uh, a natural tendency towards some shrinkage. There's decrease in terms of blood flow to that area of the body and so forth. So that even if it's not sexual activity per se, but sometimes even doing vaginal dilation for some women uh, becomes important just to maintain the elasticity of the vaginal tissue. Uh, you know, certainly uh, any type of sexual activity or self-pleasuring increases blood flow to that area, and we know that blood flow is critical for physical health of tissue throughout the body. So, um, and we do find that uh, women who have not been sexual uh, as they age, if they perhaps are widowed or been divorced and they've not been in a sexual relationship for a number of years, that there, there's a tendency, it's not irreversible, it can certainly be corrected, but there's a natural tendency for the, uh, the tissue of the, uh, the vagina to start to lose uh, uh, some of its elasticity. There's decreased blood flow so that the uh, tissue itself can become thinner, easier to tear, and so forth, so that uh, there are things that certainly women can do to increase vaginal health, whether they're sexually active or not. Okay, so, and, and these are both over-the-counter things, uh, lubricants, um, exercises. Where, where does a woman go to find out what she should do? Vibrators, um, a host of things that, um, uh, that women can use. Uh, some women will uh, use a dilator, and it's not just for self-pleasuring, but sometimes, especially if they have not been sexual for a while, and now suddenly they're uh, starting up in a new sexual relationship, and there's there's some concerns about um, uh, tightness in terms of uh, not feeling adequately lubricated and so forth. So certainly lubricants, the use of, of dilators uh, or vibrators uh, are all means of being able to increase uh, vaginal health. And how important for a woman who's experiencing those things and might be entering into a new relationship for that to be a point of discussion with the man? Uh, absolutely very important. And, um, of course, the challenge will be sometimes that the male's not ready to have that discussion. Um, it's also important for the woman to uh, be comfortable uh, bringing it up with her health care provider. Uh, especially if we're talking about a woman who has not been sexual for a while, again, because of divorce, widowhood, whatever, and uh, has met someone, wants to be sexually uh, active, it's, it's important to have that discussion with the health care provider. And um, basically, if the health care provider seems somewhat embarrassed by that question, too bad, you're paying them, embarrass them, but, right. uh, or right. him or her. Yeah. But, uh, this is important information. This is information that you're entitled to. And we're going to talk about that blue pill in a couple of minutes, but I want to talk about why isn't there a pink pill? And, or is there a pink pill for women? There, there is not yet a pink pill, and it's not from a lack of trying. Uh, because of the success of Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, the, uh, all the pills that we see advertised so frequently on television, uh, it's been like a great gold rush for the pharmaceutical companies to try to find the equivalent uh, in, in terms of the magic pink pill for, for women. It's not there. We think uh, part of it is that biologically, uh, sexual, sexual response for women is um, in some ways more complex, uh, even though externally speaking, it seems like, well, there's not many parts to have to worry about, whereas with men with erections, but it is, you know, rather complex, uh, but it's not from a lack of trying in the pharmaceutical companies. It's uh, kind of like the great gold rush that they're still looking for that pink pill to put on the market. Well, we'll have to expand this topic at some later point. I want to switch gears and, and close out this part of our show. And thank you for being with us for this part of our show. We're going to ask Dr. Seguru back for another episode. So welcome back to Graceful Aging and you'll hear more good information in a future show. Thanks for being with us. We've got about 10, seven minutes or so. We've got seven minutes for questions. So is there a question for Dr. Segru? 
There we go, Noreen. I know we can count on you. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about sex appeal and about foreplay. When your body changes, you know, when you're young, you just sort of are in touch with sex appeal. You know, you wear a lower cut dress or just something that you, you're aware of. As you age, sex appeal seems to um, manifest itself differently. And finding that road is a little more complicated, at least in my thinking. And also foreplay. I'd like to know more about the kinds of foreplay or what makes up foreplay as you age? Two great questions. One of the interesting things is with sex appeal, uh, when we're younger, it's again, body characteristics and so forth, but attitude probably becomes far more significant when we talk about sex appeal as we grow older. Um, it's, it's much less about um, the shape of the body or whatever, but it's, it's much more someone who is comfortable in their own skin. We find that people find, especially as we get older, that becomes um, a, a real aphrodisiac, a turn on, because the individual knows what their body is capable of, they know how to enjoy being physically intimate with their partner uh, and to make that connection. So you know, that becomes a, a very important part of uh, you know, for the individual. And then the second part of your question was with foreplay. Um, I often tell, will tell people that foreplay is taking the garbage out for your partner after dinner. <laughs> it's, it's the activity that starts to create a sense of connection for the couple. So that it's not, and for many couples, uh, especially as we get older, what we have traditionally referred to as foreplay actually becomes the sex play because you know, erections are not always possible for the individual. So as a result of that, um, rather than saying, well, why bother having sex or even trying because I can't do it because I can't get an erection or he can't get hard. Instead, what we try to do is help couples to appreciate the fact that lovemaking is not always going to uh, require uh, an erect penis. It's not always going to require penetration and thrusting and so forth, but instead what we're talking about is being physical with each other, emotionally connected, and that becomes an important part of the whole sexual experience that I think we become much better with as we get older because um, our bodies have changed, not for, you know, to our detriment, but it becomes possible to start really making a connection of that appreciation of flesh on flesh that uh, can be uh, an incredibly pleasurable and arousing experience. We have another question back here. Uh, just two quick questions, doctor. What's the uh, oldest couple that you've ever treated? And when all else fails in terms of uh, medication like Viagra and the other medications, do you ever advise people on any type of uh, herbal remedies? I'm sorry, do I ever advise? Do you ever advise them on any type of herbal remedies? Uh, I'll start with the, uh, uh, the last question first. In terms of um, herbal remedies and so forth, there are many products out there that are supposed to be aphrodisiacs and so forth. Um, there are very few over-the-counter medications or supplements or whatever that uh, very few that have any what we consider gold standard scientific evidence to support that uh, they either will increase erectile response, increase sexual interest, and so forth. Um, there are some things out there. I won't name uh, products, but uh, there are some herbal supplements that may be of some help, but the, the research, uh, the jury is still out on that. And then your first question was? Uh, what's the oldest couple that you've ever treated? Um, oldest couple, uh, the gentleman was 85 and his partner was 82. Okay. And, <laughs> and did it work? Yes. <laughs> and as I recall, she was complaining he was coming too quickly. So, God bless him. <laughs> 
Dr. Sigur, thank you again for being a guest on Graceful Aging. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me here.